So, good morning. We are here at Riverside School in East London. We've got two head teachers with us. Andy Roberts, who's the head of this school here. Janice Davis, the head of a school a few miles away. Let's just find out a little bit about your schools. First of all, Andy, this school here, give us a little pen picture. How big is it? How many pupils? That sort of thing. So, Riverside School was founded in 2012 when I was the founding head teacher. We were on a temporary site for five years, so we had a very slow, gradual intake for those first five years. Um, so we're not at capacity at the moment. We have approximately 1,100 students, and at full capacity, we will be 1,800 students, including approximately 300 in the sixth form. We're on the fringe of East London. What's your catchment area like? What sort of demographic does the school serve? So the catchment area is very diverse, um, about 40% black African, 20% Bengali, 20% white British, and then a variation in the others. About 50% of them are pupil premium. So it's in the top 5% most disadvantaged wards in the UK. And we're a stone's throw from the River Thames, aren't we? We are Riverside School on the north bank of the River Thames, about half a kilometre away. Okay, Janice, your school, Sydney Russell School, also yeah. in the London borough of Barking and Dagenham. Dagenham and Barking. Which way round is it? Barking and Dagenham. Barking and Dagenham. Two or three miles away from where we're now sitting? Very close neighbours indeed. Okay, so give us a, a pen picture of your school. Uh, a large school, uh, 2,500, still not at capacity, that's 2,700. We're an all-through school, so it's 4 through to 30, uh, year 13. Intake, same as Andy's really, local children, high deprivation indicator, free school meals, very similar demographics. So bigger year groups at the moment, sort of two or 300 in each year group? Uh, 300 from year 7 to 11, 360 in every year group. Okay. Great. We've got a picture of the two schools then. So both the, the reason we're here is to talk to you with your head teacher hats on because both of your schools in varying ways have got uh, involved in the past two or three years with the local maths hub uh, and mainly with this teaching for mastery in maths. We'll come on to that a bit later, but I'd like to ask you both just generically. Uh, you've both sort of said yes to allowing your teachers to get involved in maths hub work, which has taken them out of the school where they've devoted time to things outside their school, uh, not always an easy decision to make um, for a head teacher. So I'd, I'd just like both of you some headline observations about whether it has been worth it, Janice. Uh, a number of years ago, I'd say our Achilles heel was maths, raising achievement in maths. Uh, we tried all sorts of programs, studies, all sorts of strategies, but really making that big jump, it comes down to the classroom holding on to your teachers, training your teachers. And that was where the whole notion of the maths had math mastery came into its own. Um, and for us, it's what we needed to embed maths, to raise achievement in maths, engage in maths, and move the whole department forward. So it helped us keep teachers, raise achievement in maths, improve engagement in maths, helping at all the different strands. Okay, we'll unpick some of those details in a moment. Andy, your uh, general observation? So as a new school in 2012, trying to recruit maths teachers mm -hmm. of, any, of any type really was near on impossible. So we decided to set up strategy whereby we took graduates from universities and, and trained our own. And therefore, professional development become critically important to our success, if you want. So we have always been a school that values professional development very, very highly. And we go out there and look for opportunities of this quality to enable our math teachers to continually improve. And, and you know, the, the thinking um, in the math department throughout the school is that, you know, no teacher is finished, everyone has capacity to improve, and, and that's, that's the baseline, really. And this obviously supports that principle. So let's unpick some of the factors. The, the, the first factor is uh, when you uh, engage in this sort of thing, inevitably, class teachers who are used to teaching their classes will be out of school for two or three days a term possibly uh, and sometimes that's a difficult, some heads would regard that as a difficult decision to make. So Janice, what, what's your attitude to letting teachers out of class, out of the building to do something else not directly related to their classes? Yes, I, I don't see that as a difficult call at all. Uh, I think the only way that we can keep teaching fresh, alive and of quality is to allow teachers Headroom, headroom where they can meet other mathematicians or other teachers. It's not only maths that I would apply this policy to. Um, it's where they can explore, when, when they can co-plan. So I think that's really, really important. If you're going to breathe life 
and relevancy into any subject. I don't see that as a decision at all. I think it's essential. Andy? All teachers at Riverside School have two hours additional release in order to develop professionally. That's the, that's their own time. One of those hours is spent in department on subject-specific pedagogy timetabled each week. And then another hour is, is for coaching and, and locked-in um, observations and other support. Giving teachers space and time to develop professionally is incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. So what's most important to us is the quality of that provision. So we're not careless with letting teachers do whatever course they want. There has to be a certain quality, and the NCETM meets that standard. How do you deal with it just on a practical basis uh, when some of your teachers are out of school? Is it, is it quite easy to get them replaced in, in classrooms? Is, just, is this just routine bread and butter stuff? Uh, like when teachers are ill, for example? I mean, for, uh, for us, it's very much like that. We have a number of cover supervisors that we employ. Uh, we have support within the departments who, who cover for each other and support each other's development. I mean, similar to what Andy was saying, if I take our maths department, they have additional non-contact time where they take from the maths mastery, where they co-plan, where they dissect, where, where they look at the barriers. And I think that is what then makes a difference to what happens within that classroom. So actually, I think if you've got really quality teaching going on, a teacher not being there, for, for a small period of time is not the issue. It's not more lessons, that's not the answer. It's quality, it's quality of time. Uh, and I think you can therefore give teachers headroom and not impact on the classroom if what you deliver is quality. Do you agree with that? So I would say our, our teachers are, are true professionals and if you respect them as professionals and you give them time to develop, they respect that. So when Neil, for example, went to Shanghai or he's, he's out of school on training or supporting another school, the maths department don't think twice about stepping in and, and supporting and covering those lessons. So I, I would say it does not impact on the quality of, of learning in the school, but if anything makes the department more collaborative um, in the way that they support one another for the, for the mm. gain of, of you know, a good education. And they know eventually their turn, their turn will come. That picks up on another point about to what degree do you see when you let individual teachers engage in professional development, do you see that really as indirectly the department uh, changing for the better or uh, rather than just one teacher? Because teachers can, of course, leave. Individual teachers can leave. So if they haven't left some sort of a legacy in the department or influenced the entire department, then perhaps... Um, the professional development hasn't worked uh, as well as it could. So do you feel that it's a departmental thing as well as an individual thing? I accept there's a place for both. There are particular teachers who have particular needs. But generally, I think when teachers are going out, it's for the general good. Um, and the whole notion of a teacher just going out and taking something themselves and it going no further, I don't think it's cost effective. So the beauty of working with a math sub is what is going out comes back in and informs practice across the department. I and mean, very similar to Andy, our math teachers then have the time to take that, dissect and move forward. I think that is really important. It's not individual. It has to be institutional. Ditto. Individual development versus departmental uh, development. So we have quite a strict criteria when we're selecting professional development for staff and it needs to be sustained and it needs to be collaborative and it needs to bring in external expertise where possible and it needs to be subject specific and evidence informed and this meets all of that criteria and in some instances it will develop the individual but there has to be a, a departmental gain as a consequence yeah. of that. But it's the, it's the structure and systems within the school that enable that. I think if one teacher is being developed and that has no impact on the rest of the department, there's probably something wrong there with your systems and structures. Mm. So you're a geography teacher. Correct. History Historian. teacher. To what extent, if at all, have you engaged in any detail with how maths teaching is being encouraged to change at all? Or have you wholly left it up to your professionals in the departments? For me, as a historian, um, what, what I did initially was actually meet, work very, very closely with, with Manu, who links with the Maths Hub, who, who, who gave me an in-depth insight into maths and the problems and the blocks. 
Um, I also then met with the maths department, but again, looking at the vision, the understanding, what does it mean? The maths had the master, what's it mean? Uh, the same, we did a presentation at SLT, we did a presentation at Governors. The nuts and bolts, no, but the vision and the theory, yes, there was a lot of engagement at that level because I'm making a commitment, um, a time commitment, so at that level, yes. Okay, so you, it wasn't completely blind? But, uh, Absolutely no, not. No, no okay. because it is a commitment and yeah. we've invested in it. Um, and, you know, it's like Andy says, these maths teachers aren't that there. We need to get that vision right and that training right. So I value subject-specific pedagogy very highly. And, you know, I do not claim to be a, an expert maths teacher or an expert on maths pedagogy. But I do like to get beneath the surface of the pedagogy because I think there's there's much that I see in maths at the moment that, that is transferable. It's not unique to maths. There are a lot of things that are, but it's not unique to maths, such as the, the, the why is as important as the how in maths and other subjects could learn from that, or recognising the misconceptions and how we learn from those and how we avoid those. Again, that, that's applicable to all subjects. So some elements I find fascinating, just out of interest more than anything, but very much maths is you know the domain of the maths graduate and the maths trained teacher without doubt. Uh, finally, almost finally, if a head who was a bit sceptical pressurised the two of you and said, I'm, I'm still not convinced, tell me what you have seen going on around your school that convinces you that this has been worthwhile, either in lessons, either in the staff room or, or in any way really, where have you seen impact which has told you, yep, this has been worthwhile, this? Okay. I think that's, that's easy for me. We had a disparate maths department. Um, we had programs of study, but very different approaches. Um, not even a team particularly. What you would see now if you came into Sydney or our office of Homeless is you would see a set of maths teachers that operate as a department, operate as a team, that meet regularly um, and they discuss maths and they discuss the teaching of maths. Uh, you would see a department that has meeting times that they set up themselves after school to look at practice. What you'd also see, um, I'm very pleased to say, is improved outcomes and very encouragingly, the number of our students that want to go on to do maths at A level um, because they actually enjoy maths in a good way, you would actually see physical data outcomes as well as that softer culture ethos. And that would be very, very clear. That's the difference it will make. That's convincing. Andy? So for us, it's the conceptual thinking about maths and the approach to maths pedagogy without a doubt. Um, so, for example, I think ultimately making young people mathematicians and love maths, I think it's quite strongly influenced that. It's always been a big aim of the school and that's why we were attracted to this particular project. A, a simple example, I suppose, could be now we have students that will take and happily take multiple approaches to solving a problem, whereas historically we would have children who had got the answer correct and didn't understand the need then to, to look at it in a different way and do it again. And now the culture, so the culture around maths has changed and I think that's a very healthy thing. And it's really nice here and we used to hear a lot of, or I see a lot of, I can't do maths. I can't do maths, I don't like maths. You don't hear that now, which is assuring. That's great. Has, has a knock-on been a bit more contact between local schools? Um, your your teachers talking to each other across across school boundaries has that had any um, we've tangible always, effect? Um, we've always worked closely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so less so probably, but but wider afield, most definitely. You know, Neil went to was fortunate enough to go to Shanghai for the two weeks mm -hmm. to look at mastery there, which I, I think made a really strong network of people that, that he brought back some great ideas. Mm. And I know a man who works with a lot, but he works with Neil, for example, on this side, and goes out and works with other schools and brings back. So there's a lot more linking, maybe at a different level. 
Yeah, those two gents you've just mentioned, yeah. one, one at each school, math specialists who, who themselves yeah. have engaged uh, with maths hubs yeah, as well. I, and I should probably say something, just thinking about some of the advantages of this programme for the school. I should say something about the primary schools that, that are increasingly using a mastery approach to teaching maths and, and doing it very, very well at the moment. Um, and I think probably initially we, we, we were on a little bit of a back foot there. Um, in addition to that, our intake, it's, it's variable. There are, there, are, there are a massive range of gaps in the young people we get from you know, 14 different feeder primaries. So the mastery approach just, just works superbly when, when you're in this particular context. I mean, for us, it came, our first sort of taste of it came through primary because we took in the mass, uh, a mass mastery approach of primary and saw the results there that made us think, well, if it's working in the primary, shouldn't we be looking at it at secondary? That's the advantage of being the all-through school. So that was the initial in for us. So a, a quick final look at, to the future. Can you see your schools just continuing to engage with the Maths Hub almost a, a, as, as routine exercise now? I'd see no reason why we wouldn't because uh, I, I just think there's much more work to be done. So we always, we're always on the lookout for high quality mm -hmm. professional development which is subject specific and, and you don't really get better than this. So most definitely. Good. Thank you very much.